want to continue this series on uh, resisting anxiety. We've defined it this way, a feeling of worry, nervousness, unease, typically about an intimate event or something you are, uh, has a, that has an out, uncertain outcome. Anxi anxiety can be very normal in stressful situations such as public speaking or uh, taking a test. Anxiety can also be abnormal. Uh, when you uh, get sweating because of your anxiety or you have some make, are making some unstable decisions or you increase in heart rate, there might be a problem. And one conclusion we've come to is that anxiety has become e epidemic. And what's concerning is we are seeing a sharp rise among our young people and children. That's not good. There must be reasons for this. We have to address those reasons. So while we're getting our blessing and getting our thrills and chills, we better be careful that we're paying attention to what's going on in our home. Amen. While you're getting your blessing, make sure you know what's going on in your home with your kids, and what they're being inundated with and what they're watching and listening to. But it's not just young people. Adults are dealing with anxiety more than ever before. Unrealistic expectations in our culture. People comparing themselves with others. I've referred the last couple of weeks to a conversation that went on with Pastor Zach and how he was saying, we've got, to, we've got to step up, we've got to have help, we've got to have some partnerships between churches and schools. We've got to figure out how to work together instead of against one another, acting like we each have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. There's only one answer, it's Jesus Christ. I know that from the bottom of my heart, but we've got to figure out how to get that message out and how to work together to combat anxiety. How many of you know that he wants to break anxiety in our lives? We can give him praise for that. He really is. He's the anxiety breaker. Absolutely. I want to say this. I haven't, I haven't went there yet, and then we'll read the scripture in just a moment. But, but, but listen, young people and, and anyone who's listening that's vulnerable to comparing yourself uh, or, or vulnerable to bullying or vulnerable to being overly sensitive when it comes to what someone thinks about you, can I ask you to push that out in the name of Jesus? Because if you're on social media too long, you're gonna come across that. And if you're vulnerable to that, you're gonna have problems. I remember years ago, my parents coaching me, we should be concerned what others think about us only to a certain level. When it comes to a point where it's unfair judgment and people are trying to draw you into put downs, you need to resist that and walk away from that. It's their loss. Now, some may not like that kind of strong talk, but I will tell you, for your health's sake, you need to not care so much about what everybody thinks about you. Being popular only goes so far. It'll create anxiety and bullying. Don't let somebody bully you. Do you know who you serve? You serve a mighty God who has your back. Am I okay? I believe if parents, pastors, and School partnerships will come together and share in our efforts through prayer and teaching and coaching. We can turn the, uh, the trends around, and we can do that by faith. Over the past few weeks, I've been advocating that anxiety is a Pauline theme in chapter 4. And we must address that when diving deeper into Philippians 4. We love to take the promises and pull them out and quote them and claim them without ever digging down into it and seeing what he's really saying. The writer offers three scenarios when dealing with the topic of anxiety, and I'd like to advocate that the enemy of our soul knows our human nature so well that he sets up schemes and traps and circumstances in order to create anxiety in our lives. Do you believe that? The first scheme was, was to set us up with trouble. Whenever someone has trouble, we dealt with it two weeks ago, and we were told that we can resist anxiety in Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. We can resist anxiety when feeling trouble. Don't let trouble cause you to feel anxiety. Welcome to the real world. Is there anybody here that's never experienced trouble? Trouble. When you're troubled, what did he say to do? Promote praise. Rejoice in the Lord always. He said, portray gentleness. Let your gentleness be known unto all men, for the Lord is at hand. He said, push out anxiety. Be anxious for nothing. Are you with me? Be anxious for nothing. He said, persist in prayer, but in everything by prayer and supplication, mingle together with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God. 
He said, promote the promise and the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your heart and your mind. He'll keep sanity in place. He'll guard you. He'll guard your emotions. He'll protect you from the problems that come with anxiety. Promote praise. Promote the promise. Persist in prayer. He said, ponder some good thoughts. Whatsoever things are lovely. He gives a whole list. You have to control your thinking. And last week, we talked about resisting anxiety when you're facing human limitations. You have to take personal responsibility. Everybody say, I can. I can. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can. So we have to take personal responsibility. I can is the human limitation, but we all have to have a little I can. You got to get a little I can. I can can take you a long ways, but I can has human limitations. When I can joins up with through Christ Jesus, whom strengthens me, the human limitations are done away with because I can do all things through Christ whom strengthens me. Do you believe that today? Through him, there's nothing you can't overcome. So today, let's look at the third scheme the enemy uses, resist anxiety when there's a lack of resources. You ever had a lack of resources? Have you bought food in a restaurant lately? You drove up to the gas pumps lately? There's some things that are pressing on our resources. You checked out your retirement fund lately? Have you checked out the interest rates lately? There's some things that are going on that uh, can cause us to be guarded about our finances. It can cause anxiety. Paul knew the human nature that we possessed. And having a lack of finances can create anxiety. It can create anxiety in leadership. It can create anxiety in your family. It can create anxiety in your personal life. It's a big deal. So how do we cope with that? Let's read it together, beginning with verse uh, 14. Could we stand together? I'm going to stand with you on this one. Let's stand together. You ready? Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, watch this, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica... You sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. That's powerful, isn't it? I want you to read this last verse with me because we're going to break this down. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. You need to read that or say that like you believe it. Are you ready? And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Make it easy to speak in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. So the Apostle Paul is expressing thankfulness to this Philippian church for their generosity to him during his season of lack. So the question is, how do we resist anxiety when we're lacking, when you're told you may lose your job, we can yawn and say, thank God he's the provider, hallelujah, until someone tells you you're about to lose your job, the yawn will leave and anxiety will set in. When things begin to get shaky, when things begin to unnerve you because the budget doesn't look right, it's not adding up. You're going in the hole. Some of you are sitting here today and you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of those things are happening to you because it's not your choice. You've had done very little to be able to control what's going on around you. Some of us are going through it because it was our choice and we need to learn to be a bit more disciplined with our finances. There's only one amen in the whole house here. Some things we cause, right? And we cause our own anxiety. That's good preaching, Pastor Kelvin. Those things we need to take responsibility for, okay? We really do. We're moving right along quick. I want you to hear the rest of this. But then there's those things that are outside of our control. The Apostle Paul finds himself in a situation where it's outside of his control. He found himself with a lot of lack, a lot of need. And so he thanks them because the Philippian church was there. 
He was able to count on them, not, not just once, but twice in two desperate situations he found himself in. They came through. Aren't you thankful for partnerships and people that can come through in time of need? Amen. Yeah. We need to be thankful for that. So the question is, how do we resist anxiety when there's a lack of resources? Well, first, like Paul, we need to understand that the provision comes through partnerships. If you read the verses before we started reading and start with verse 11 on, you will find two kinds of partnerships there that are described in verses 11 through 17. Actually, then when you pick up with verse 19, you'll find the next partnership. But the first one is from relationships in the church. You need partnerships in relationships with the church. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. Now you Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving but you only. No, for even in Thessalonica you sent aid. In other words, you did it again when I went to Thessalonica. And then again it was for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I wasn't seeking your money. I wasn't seeking your prosperity. I'm seeking the idea that I want you to be blessed bountifully. I want you to prosper. I want it to be added to your account. Paul is so thankful for the way the church assisted him while in need. Early in his ministry, finding himself in this great need He's leaving Macedonia. And by the way, Macedonia was an impoverished place. We know that from the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, when Paul is lifting an offering for the Macedonians from the church at Corinth, trying to help them because they're desperate, hungry, in need. And no one, when no one else came through, the Philippian church was a giving church. And listen, people want to critique and criticize the church, but most churches do significant things in their community. Did you know that? I have picked up social media, speaking about social media through the years. It could have given me anxiety if I would have believed it, which has done nothing but tear the church down. The church is done with. The world would love to see the church done with. They don't like the church. In fact, they see it as a political machine when it should be. It's not a political machine. It should be a God-worshiping machine. There's a big difference. And there's some criticisms perhaps that we can, can kind of own and take to heart. But, but, but the criticism that have come down about the church is unwarranted in many cases. They, they did this without knowing. They did this out of, frankly, and I'm not being mean, but they, did this, they do this out of ignorance. Just this past month, let me give you a little report. Just this past month, Westmore loved on the city of San Antonio. We sent... Over 100 volunteers out to Operation Compassion to take a day and do nothing but pack boxes of supplies because of the poverty in San Antonio. And we didn't want to have, the, have our movement just roll into San Antonio with a big splash and, and a lot of hype. And there's nothing wrong with moves of God and all of that. But we didn't want to roll in there without saying, hey, we want to love San Antonio. There's souls to be saved on the street. And we want to figure out how to bless and how to help these immigrants that are coming across the border and have nowhere to put their head. Now, no matter what you feel about the immigrants, the fact is they're human beings and they have needs. The fact is that they're there and they were hungry. And watching that line line up and cars line up, trying to find a way to just get to the front to get a box off a 53-foot semi. And thanks to Steve Bullens and Chandler for making sure that the truck got out there. But it was a wonderful thing to watch people and to be able to serve people. Can we give the Lord praise that he gave us the power and the know-how to do that? <laughs> Operation Compassion was key in making that happen in our partnership. Um, just this past month, we supported the school system with seeking to find solutions for anxiety, and we're continuing to work on that because it's a problem. We spent time on researching the problem with water shortages in our world. A lot of time was spent on that this past month, just looking at it. We've worked toward finalizing plans on building a warehouse so that we can get some forgotten 20 and 30 year olds that are in jail and everybody's forgotten about them except their wives and parents. And they're sitting over there because of layered misdemeanors and low-grade felons. They're not, a, they're not murderers. They're mischievous. And I've said this through the years. They need a kick in the rear end and a hug around the neck and somebody to pray with them and cry with them and help them move forward. 
We're trying to figure out how to get some help to those people and get some skill sets in their lives where we can give them more than Jesus. I love giving Jesus, but they need more than Jesus. They need to figure out how to get a job and make some good money so they don't have to return to the cycle they're in. That's good preaching, Pastor Kelvin. We need to care about that. I don't mean to be offensive when I say that. I just want you to be aware that this is serious business. In just the last month, We've assisted with moving Vera's cousins out of a danger zone in Ukraine to safety in Poland. Amen. Yeah, we got invo- had to get involved with that. We moved more containers to Europe in order to help with the Ukrainian crisis. Lisa's behind all of that, helps us. We've assisted with some families who experienced death and surgeries and unexpected disasters. Westmore has assisted in make- making bedding mats for the homeless. We provided backpacks and school supplies for families in need. And you say, well, pastor, you're bragging. You know why? Because people say we don't do anything. That you're just this pretty church sitting out here on a highway. You bought a golf course and you're a country club and you don't do anything. To you nowhere with that. I know what we do every day, and I know what our staff does, and I know what our leadership does, and I know where we're going in that. And we will continue, we will continue to be on the front lines to help people. Now let's give the ultimate provider the biggest praise of the day because he's the one that deserves the glory and praise for all that he does. I just want to say I'm so thankful for our Westmore family. Through Operation Compassion, we have moved loads and loads of trucks to the flooding disaster in Kentucky over the last few weeks. We've not stopped that. We've continued to move trucks when overseers call and field directors call and partners up their call. We do what we can do to get product into those people. And everybody else is sitting at home criticizing and telling you how to do it. I'm proud of Westmore because we've partnered. We're on the front lines getting it done with Operation Compassion. Westmore. We've got business to do. We've got people to rescue. And we've got people to build up. We're not interested in being pretty. All this purdy is just ministry tools. We're not interested in being purdy. We want to build people up for the kingdom of God. That's what we've got to do. I'm thankful for our partners. I'm thankful for givers. That's what Paul is saying. You partnered and God provided a need through you. When you think you can be an island out there by yourself because you got miffed because somebody, one person out of 1,700 and some members made me mad and I just can't walk back. What what, what in God's name are you thinking? There's relationships everywhere. We need one another. And you may not need me today. You may not need us today, but there'll come a day when we need one another. I've recently needed you. I know what it is to say. I know people are praying. I know what it is when somebody brought over a meal and helped out. I know what it is when people are saying, hey, I want to encourage you. I've got a word. I want to say something to you. There's times that we need one another. Westmore, we've got business to do. We've got people to help. We've got people to rescue. And we've got people to build up. The second partnership that produces provision is not just relationships with one another. By the way, I want to say thank you for that. In fact, let me just take this further. Our staff, and I know they know this, needs to be thankful to the partnerships we have with our people because they couldn't get to the hospitals every day and they couldn't put food on their table at night and they couldn't get up here and put a choir together and they couldn't be where they need to be throughout the week and helping folks and counseling and doing all that they do all week. They couldn't do it without the church. Let's give ourselves a hand and the Lord a hand for what he's done to us. The second provision comes from not only a partnership with the church, like the Philippians were there for the Macedonians and they were there for Paul. There's benefit in that. Can I assure you this? If you're a member and you really have a need, I'm not talking about being yanked around and I'm not talking about folks that want to come in and manipulate and tell the same sad story just to get a buck. We we work on that. We work on that. I'm not being mean. We just want to help you. Sometimes help is sitting down and taking a financial peace class or looking at your budget, getting a few business people to sit down with you so they can help you. You know, you've heard the old saying, teach you how to fish instead of just giving you fish. Because if you don't know how to fish, you have to keep coming back and ask for more fish. 
But if we teach you how to fish and how to budget and how to work through things, that's what the family of God needs to do. And then we'll also be there when there's need. We'll do our best to be there when there's need. We're not perfect at it. There's times we don't know things. We don't hear things. We're the last one to find out. We've taken heat for that. And you find out after everybody else has found out. But you do your best. And we will do our best to take care of membership. I want membership to mean something at Westmore. I really do. Because we're family. In fact, I'm going to go take one step further. We can't take care of the whole world. I can't even take care of all of Cleveland through you, but we can take care of the household of faith first. And when the household of faith is strong, we can do a lot more business in our world. Does that make sense? We take care of the household of faith. That's what Paul said. Take care of the household of faith first. Because if you're out here doing all the business out here and you're not taking care of one another, you're not going to have anything to do out there. I know that makes sense. Now, let's move. That wasn't even in my notes. It's free. Let's move to the second partnership. It's relationship with Christ. Now, Christ works through his body. But then there's this personal relationship with Christ. Notice what he says in verse 19. My God. My. Uh, my makes it kind of personal, doesn't it? Not, not just yours, but mine. He's my God. It's personal. He's mine and I'm his. He cares about my lack because he's my God. And even though he's personal, he's God. He's big God. Because he's personal doesn't make him less God. And because he's personal doesn't make him a weak God. He's a big God that's over all and all. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's omniscient. He's all knowing. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's all of that. But he's also a personal God who gets intimate with me and knows my lack. My God. He's a personal God. And while we are thankful how God uses relationship in the church, it's amazing how he can lay something on someone's heart without you even prodding or asking. How many have had that happen? We, we, there's times we can get a little tight with cash, with Operation Compassion, and, and Lisa has this thing. She called me this past week, and, and, uh, and, and, and about, about the same, same time Mike's calling, and, and somebody just had it laid on their heart, and we're struggling with how to get, how to get trucks. And by the way, that's another way Westmore's involved. I think we sent, we, I don't know how many drivers, 11 drivers, something like that, came out of Westmore to move product to Kentucky. Guys volunteered who were retired or had some extra time and drove the trucks up there. Aren't you thankful for those guys? Let's give a hand to, to those men that helped us get product up there. But Lisa called, and she said, Pastor, and she always has this happy dance thing. I can't even picture it, but a happy dance. She said, happy dance, um, a $50,000 check just came in. The Lord laid it on somebody's heart. We don't even, I didn't know him, and I think she might have a little relationship with him, but there was no prodding, there was no asking, but we have to put fuel in trucks, we have to move trucks, we have to, we have to figure out how to get drivers of big trucks, and we need that cash to move product. A $50,000 check came in out of nowhere just because the Lord put it on somebody's heart, and we didn't even have an opportunity to ask ask for anything. Can we give the Lord praise for that? That's the way he supplies our needs. He supplies our needs. So we're thankful. And secondly, if one is seeking to overcome anxiety because of a lack of provision, not only understand that provision comes through partnership with Christ and with others, but also understand that one should pray for the prosperity of partners. Now we're going to dig down into the motives of our heart sometimes. Not that I seek the gift. Watch what he says here. You were so good to me, thank you. But I was never really seeking the gift. What I have sought is that your account abounds. Are you getting this? I want to be careful here because only God sees the motives of the heart. But there are people that have made a business out of smooching up to somebody they think has a lot. They'll go to churches and even rearrange where they sit in order to make that happen. And people get tired of it. When are you going to trust God? Am I okay? I feel like I need to duck for some reason. I, I'm glad I'm behind this thing. But it's true. Motives of the heart. Motives that, that are going to make it happen. Somehow they've convinced themselves that it's who I know. I've had people come to me and say, 
How did you, how do you get that relationship? Or how did, how did that happen? You know so-and-so. How do, I can say before God, God, and Debbie, I believe Debbie will vouch for me. I can say before God, I have not sought those relationships out, but if a door opens and advice is asked or partnership is asked and we're put together because of where I'm placed or any of that, God has taken care of that. And my prayer has been, and Debbie will tell you, we pray that our people who are partners, that they will abound and abound and abound. I mean, big time abound. I'm not a bit jealous of somebody that has because God puts it in their grasp so that they can bless others. We wouldn't be sitting here today on this campus if it wasn't for wonderful partners who've gotten involved with us and said, hey, I buy into the vision. I buy into the Westmore family. I want to see God do big things to the Westmore family. Now, can we let those partners know we appreciate what they do and how they are used by God to bless us? We wouldn't have student ministries building. We wouldn't be able to do near what we do if it wasn't for partners. And it's not, it's not that those partners are any more important than any partners, all partners, but we need to pray for one another that they all abound. I had a, I have a friend, I should say, and uh, it was a God moment. We were out of town, and we've been, we've been friends for a lot of years, and uh, I've never asked him. He's blessed. I've never went and asked him for anything. I'll ask his dad one time, but I've never asked him for anything. We were a friend for, been friends for 20-some years. And annually, we have a little getaway time, and he insists that uh, I go on a run with him, and we'll get out of town a little bit and just empty the mind, and he likes to pick the brain with Scripture. We talk about Scripture more than anything else. He loves to talk about Scripture. And one morning, I got up, and we, we were planning on breaking ground for this ministry resource center, and I'll never forget him saying, where are you at with that building project? And I was determined that I wasn't going to ask, and I can't say that it didn't cross my mind. But I was waiting for the right moment, and I wanted to be a God moment. Otherwise, I wanted to pass on by because my friendship is not worth me begging people for money. It's not. It's not. I will not fall into that trap. And I remember all of a sudden, he's making us some coffee, and all of a sudden, he said, where are you at? And I told him. He said, I want to I help. And he has helped significantly. And he's not a member of this church. He doesn't even attend here. Relationships. But it's how you treat people. You are far more transparent than you think you are. Is it about the relationship, or is it about what somebody has? I'm trying to help you this morning as your pastor. Just because you think they have, I'll also tell you this, a lot of people you think have don't. And there's a lot of people sitting here, I found out through the years, that don't wear brand name clothing or drive brand name cars. They have. And I'm not about to tell you who they are because you change where you sit. I mean, they have. And they hide it. They hide it good, but they have. But I've watched those people step up with tears in their eyes and say, you know what, God wants me to do this, and it'll floor you. So a lot of you think you know where the resources come, and you've tried to analyze that. You have no idea. You really have no idea. We serve a big God who puts partnerships in our place that helps do business. And most of all, he's the one that puts it on the heart. And he's the one that supplies the resource. For my God shall supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. Oh, come on. I can't help it. We got to give him praise for that. He's an amazing, amazing God. Um, so you have to evaluate your heart priorities. These relationships are important. I seek the fruit that abounds to your account more than I seek your gift because I want you blessed. But thank you. That's Paul's approach. Um, and then it doesn't hurt to encourage the provider through prayer. Provision is directly related to relationships. Um, let, me, let me just speak to the young people here. Don't forget who puts food on your table in your household. Seriously, 
Do you know that that roof that, that's over your head costs money? And do you know that air conditioning that you got in that house costs money? And do you know when something goes bad in that house, somebody got to fix it? And you don't have a care in the world to worry about. You just wait. <laughs> wait, it's coming. Real life will hit. But here's what your pastor loves you enough to tell you this. You know what would make your parents feel like a million bucks? And it's going to be hard for you to do it because sometimes we get stoved up inside and don't know how to do it. But if you could tell your mom and daddy, thank you. They provide for you. Learn how to do that now. They provide for you. God gives them strength and skill sets. They go make provision. Some of you looking down like, oh, God, help me right now. Yeah. Mom and dad, if they don't do that in the next three, few days, will you look at them across the table and say, when are you going to say thank you? Make them accountable. I will. I would. And there's something else. They may have an inheritance someday. It'd be good if you had a thankful heart. That's what Paul is saying. He's thankful to the giver. We take those things so, so for granted. Parents and grandparents. And the reason we have life, the reason we have, yes, it's all Christ. We can owe all things with God. Yeah, yeah, God, 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 God. But do you know God uses people? I really need to move on. I, let's go to lean on the promise. That's the next principle. Thirdly, if you're to overcome anxiety due to a lack of resources, lean on the promise. My God shall supply all your... It doesn't say wants, does it? My God shall supply all of your... But, 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 wait a minute. I, I need, well, I need, you need what? I need. It's probably a pretty abused statement. My God shall supply all your need. You know, you have to declare his promises. Here's the one promise that you have. You're going to be taken care of. The birds of the air don't have to worry. The lilies in the valley don't have to toil and worry. He says, I take care of them. Do you think the bird got up and worried this morning where he's going to eat or what he's going to eat or what menu he's going to have access to? The bird didn't give a rip about that. He just knows that God, it, somehow it's in his instinct that it's going to be there and he's going to be taken care of. You, you need the same simple faith that my God will supply. You're going to have food to eat. You're going to have clothes on your back. You're going to have somewhere, some kind of shelter. Your needs will be taken care of. And oh Lord, give our hearts gratitude for such things. We need to be thankful for the Lord is good and he's faithful unto the end. Can we give him big praise for that? He's a faithful God. He's a faithful God. So, declare his promises. And I notice contextualize Paul's words here. This has been one of the most abused scripture in all of the, all of the Bible. You'll hear the name of claimant gurus. He's going to supply, but somehow the need gets shifted to want in a subtle way. Um, but Paul understands this because just a few verses earlier, he says, it's not that I speak in regard to need. I've learned in whatever state I am to be content. I've learned how to be poor and to abound. I've learned how to be beat up and to be physically strong. I've learned all these things. But one thing I've really learned is that he's going to cover my needs and he'll give me the strength and the grace to do just that. He didn't say all of his wants were met, but all of his needs were supplied. This is a promise. There's other promises in the Bible that talk about blessings. Of course, these promises are not blank checks. We're told to delight ourselves in the Lord and he'll give us the desires of our heart. If you contextualize that, it's not a blank check, but he wants to bless you. He wants to give you good things. He wants to abundantly supply and go beyond whatever we ask or think. He is a great God who's able to do that. But the one thing that he's promised is not that he'll take care of every desire you have, but that he'll take care of your needs your needs. So declare his promise when you're leaning on that promise and define your personal need. Have you taken inventory today? What really do you need? What do you need? There's some things we need. My car breaks down, I can't get to work, and that's the only way I can make a check. I probably have a need. It'd be good to pray, to talk, to ask, to try to figure it out. Needs. This is... Good preaching, Pastor Kelvin. Let's, last, let's wrap it up. Ponder our Lord's portfolio. 
Have you ever analyzed his portfolio? It'll blow your mind. You can't. <laughs> My God shall supply all of your needs as if that's difficult. According to his riches and glory through Christ Jesus. His riches are unending. And what we mean by that is try to get some idea of the supply. Know the supply. Listen to Ephesians 3.8. To me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Listen to Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us, the riches are found in his attributes, his riches are unending, and his response is emphatic. I will. You can bank on it. You can bank on it. My God, now make sure he's yours. Don't forget that first part. But my God, is he yours today? Is he yours today? My God is the one who supply all my needs. So know the source. Not only know the supply, know the source. We can be confident in our source. My God shall, not maybe, not might, but my God shall through Christ Jesus because all fullness is found in him. This is what I want to leave you with. I've said it in years gone by. Do you need provision today? Seek the provider and not the provision. Quit chasing money. Chase the provider. The provider will make a way to get to you what you need. I can take it further. You need a source today? If you try to snuggle up to Jesus as much as you might try to snuggle up to somebody on this earth that has, you might get somewhere. Because he can speak to the heart of the giver. He can get into a heart in ways that you, you can never do. So seek the source and not the resource. Seek the healer and not the healing. Seek the miracle worker and not the miracle. Seek the blesser and not the blessing. We continue to get that all mixed up. Is Pastor okay this morning? It comes out of a relation. All fullness is found in him. He's, we used to sing an old chorus. He's all I need. He's all I really need because in him, he can rearrange things. He can create things that aren't in existence that you don't even know about. He can speak to somebody's heart. He can move A to B and B to D. He can do whatever he's got to do to get you taken care of and to fulfill the vision he has for your life. My God shall supply all of my needs According to his riches, you ain't going to bankrupt him in glory through Christ Jesus.